Wales, just west of the marches and not far from the Shakespeare country. Wales, one of the smallest nations in the world, so small in numbers that it treasures the tale of its past like the story of a family. So great in spirit that from these valley cottages, from these hillside farms, its sons and daughters have made their mark on history and yet remain loyally, even obstinately Welsh. In this little land, they still speak the tongue their Celtic ancestors brought to Britain four centuries before Julius Caesar. From this land, Welshmen have ridden forth to become leaders of nations, to shape the future of lands bigger than their own, like Henry Tudor, who became a King of England, or David Lloyd George, who led Britain through the First World War. But today we are not going so far, just to the Estetford. Almost every village in Wales has its Estetford, and the Royal National Estetford, held in North and South Wales in alternate years, is the focal point of the nation's culture, and a unique attraction for visitors. Here the bards gather in their traditional robes of white, green and blue to select and crown the prize-winning poets of the year. For above all, Wales is a land of poetry and song. Prowess in either of these is universally honoured and a Welshman who cannot sing is a contradiction in terms. If you ask a Welsh farmer, for example, how many men work for him, don't be surprised if he answers two, a baritone and a tenor. <laughs> In Ulad Vinadai, land of my fathers, is not merely a national anthem, but also the epitome of what Welshmen feel about this land of hills and mountains, which have profoundly affected its history. For they have always provided Wales with a natural defence against attack from outside. The isolation of rugged heights and narrow valleys has kept the Welsh people, the Welsh culture and the Welsh language alive since the dawn of British history, through turbulent centuries when might was right. But though every square mile of Wales is soaked in history, to the pride of its countrymen and the delight of its visitors, Wales does not live by memories alone. Hence the magnificent civic centre in the heart of Cardiff, the capital of Wales. Though it was founded in Roman times, a century and a half ago it was still only a small country town of 1800 souls. Today with its beautifully planned parks and open spaces, it is a city of a quarter of a million people a city which has preserved much gracefulness of living. Cardiff's Cathedral is one of the tallest of the many fine buildings in the civic centre in Cathays Park. At the other end of the historical scale is the massive structure of Cardiff Castle, on a site which has been in almost continuous occupation since the Romans built a fort here in the first century AD. When the Normans began to build their keep, they made use of the Roman outer walls, and much of the original Roman fabric can still be seen cheek by jowl with the work of Norman and medieval masons. Few buildings in the world can show to the visitor such a rich harvest from 2,000 years of human activity. But Cardiff is only one of the 200-odd castles in Wales, most of which are open to visitors. Conway Castle, for example, is considered the finest work of medieval fortification in the British Isles. Half a dozen miles from Conway, across the river, lies Llandidno, one of the best-loved holiday resorts on Wales' 500 miles of coastline. Llandidno surrounds a perfect bay sweeping between two headlands, the Little Orm and the Great Orm. A real family resort this, with glorious beaches for the children. 
two beaches, in fact, one each side of the Great Orme Peninsula, which is less than a mile wide. Here you can have the best of the sun either end of the day. A modern resort, but rich in legend and history. It was here, strolling along the foreshore, that Lewis Carroll first told the story of Alice in Wonderland to young Alice Liddell. It is hardly surprising that the atmosphere which helped to inspire that immortal tale can still cast a spell on holidaymakers generations later. To Llandidno Pier come comfortable passenger steamers from Liverpool, Anglesey and the Isle of Man. For Llandidno is a deep water port, handling scheduled steamer services round the year. Another Llandidno attraction is the links of the North Wales Golf Club, fronting the estuary of the River Conway. A course of great variety open to tourists, where ideal holiday golf can be enjoyed. Long scientific holes to landward contrast with adventurous holes among the estuary sand dunes. Happy Valley on the slopes of the Great Orme is famous for its rock gardens and Horfrey gardens. On the Great Orme can be found traces of Druid ceremonies and of Roman copper mines. Here too is the 12th century church of St. Tidno, who gave the town its name, Llandidno, the place of Tidno. It's a stiff, though pleasant climb to the crest of the promontory, and if you prefer to take it the easy way, there's always the importantly named Great Orme Railway, which runs from the seafront all the way to the 700-foot summit. Wales seems to have a weakness for odd railways. One of the most famous of all is the Tellatlin Railway, which starts at Towin on the west coast near Aberdovey and runs inland for six and three quarter miles to Abergynolwyn. A classic survival of the narrow gauge era, it was originally built to bring slate from Brynegluis quarries to the main line, carrying passengers almost as an afterthought. When the quarries closed in 1946, it looked like the end of the Telethlin Railway as well. But thanks to the efforts of a body of enthusiastic amateurs, it survived and is now run as a non-profit making concern available to the public by the Telethlin Railway Preservation Society. The Society's members give their free time to help run and maintain it. One of its locomotives has been in continuous operation since the line was opened in 1886. Nowadays, of course, the railway is purely a passenger line and well worth a visit. For not only does the Telethlin Railway run through some of the loveliest Welsh scenery, it's also a museum piece in complete contrast to the normal up-to-date railways in Wales. Here is perfect country for hiking, for you cannot walk a few miles without a change of scene. Close woodland gives way to bare mountain, bare mountain to hill pasture, hill pasture to river valley, all in the space of a day's tramping. Agriculture is still the basic industry of the greater part of Wales. The typical Welsh farm is small, and worked by the farmer and his family, sometimes with one paid worker, rarely with more. This too springs from the nature of the land. There are few broad plains for large-scale mechanized farming, and over a quarter of the country's farmlands are a thousand feet or more above sea level, even though the sea is nowhere more than 50 miles away. Led by the world-famous Sir John Hunt, chief of the expedition which conquered Everest, a party of climbers starts up a mountainside in Snowdonia. Sir John's home is in Wales, and it was here that he and many of his Everest party put in their training, for Wales offers some of the best climbing in Great Britain.
John Hunt's pupils on this occasion are youngsters from the Outward Bound Sea School at Aberdeen, a venture which has attracted the interest of many public figures. In addition to the normal school curriculum, it emphasizes character building and the development of young people's powers of initiative and leadership. The boys take a month's course, which includes both seamanship and rock climbing. They learn as well to travel across mountainous country by map and compass and to fend for themselves in all weathers. There have been great Welsh mountaineers, for example, Dr. Charles Evans, a native of Corwin, who was deputy to Sir John Hunt on the Everest expedition. But in general, the people of this land of mountains regard their peaks as part of a loved landscape. People come to Wales from many lands and, once having been, are sometimes haunted by it so that they return again and again. Perhaps because of the beautiful countryside, the charming villages, the friendly people. In all these things, Wales is outstanding. But perhaps it is that Wales has a living and compelling personality, an appeal the visitor never quite forgets. In this old green land, fact and fable are woven together to make the tapestry of living. Past, present and future, all are one and all are alive.